composites. If they are so wonderful, why don't we use them everywhere? Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. Here is an attractive fact. E-glass fibers are approximately 70 times stronger than steel on a strength to weight basis. 70 times, wow. Imagine a building material so astoundingly strong, we could build ships at a fraction of their current weight. That is the promise of composite materials. So if they offer such massive improvements, why don't we have composite materials everywhere? Two reasons. Number one, they do not deliver on the promised strength. And number two, designing with composites gets a lot more complicated. Today, I'm going to explain some of the practical design limits behind composite materials. Before we dive into the science, just a little bit of terminology. You're going to see lots of words thrown around in the industry, FRP, fiberglass, E-glass, S-glass. These are all different types of materials and techniques within the field of composites. And each of these materials do have slightly different properties, so an engineer should consider the relative merits of each. But for today, I just want to lump them all together under the general heading of composites, because they all follow the same science and the same rule books. At the beginning of this video, I said fiberglass had the potential to be 70 times stronger than steel. Yeah, that's never going to happen. Composites are never going to deliver on their initial promise of outstanding strength, and that's for a variety of reasons. The first problem that we have to deal with is variable strength. That number I quoted about the strength of e-glass, that was just the fiber measured under ideal circumstances. The first problem you're going to run into, that fiber strength drops off rapidly with any slight misalignment between the load direction and the fiber. And I'm talking just a few degrees here. Second, the fiber on its own is useless. All composites are a mixture of a strong fiber and a pathetically weak resin. The resin holds the fibers together, but the resin also weakens the composite part. For the final laminate, we need to balance that resin and fiber to get the right ratio. The table on your screen shows a comparison of the relative strengths between the fiber, the resin, and I've also got steel in there for a reference point. The strength of that final composite laminate lies somewhere between the two extremes of the fiber and the resin, and that's a pretty big range. So we really have to be focused on that ratio between the resin and the fiber for the final laminate. That laminate ratio is a big issue for manufacturing quality. It becomes super critical for composite materials. The manufacturer controls that fiber to resin ratio during assembly, and it can create wild swings in the strength. It all depends on achieving a consistent ratio of resin and fiber. Because what's even worse than having a low strength material is having a material with an unreliable strength that has patches of weak spots. That's why consistency is critical. But consistency is not easy. Regulatory agencies and class societies, they know this. They anticipate the variation in material quality. And when they're setting standard values for the designer to use, they anticipate the worst quality manufacturing possible. The table on your screen compares the actual tested values for e-glass composites to the standard design values that are assumed by ABS and DNVGL. Those are both class societies. That standard can be less than half of the actual tested value because the regulators need to account for the worst manufacturing quality out there. Hey, now, now, I can do better than that. I know I'm not the worst manufacturer out there. Why should I be punished for the bad people out there? This is why for critical structures, I advise that manufacturers get their layups tested if you think you can do better than the worst manufacturer out there, make sure you get credit for that. Absolutely. And if you can prove that you create higher quality, that's going to allow you to design a lighter boat with better performance. But be careful about the samples you send in for testing. 
make sure they are your best quality. Because once it's tested, you can't take it back. And the limiting design value that we use is not going to be the average of the results from those tests. The class societies require that we look at all the different samples tested and take the worst from all of the results. It's actually a little more complicated than that, depending on your class society, DNVGL. They use a statistical representation of all the samples rather than just the single worst test result. So this is where you would talk to your naval architect. But the main takeaway here is unless you're careful, material testing can do more harm than good for your performance. The other consideration is the type of test. The designer wants flexibility. We want to be able to change that layup stack to help you out and reduce weight. We can't do that if we only have test results for a completed layup. So we want single ply test results. That single ply test allows us to use that test limit for just that one layer, and then we can combine different plies when designing your structure. Now I know that's a lot of testing. Thankfully, most ship structures are not this critical. They don't require you to go to all this effort. But this does help when you're thinking long-term planning. This is a way that you can convert your company's quality into a competitive advantage. Just make sure you do it carefully. Direction matters. I'm going to say that again. The direction of your layup determines everything. You see, composites fall into a class of materials that are called orthotropic materials. That means that they display different strength limits depending on the direction of your stresses. If you pull in the direction of the fiber strands, a composite is much stronger than its other directions. We even see different limits for tension versus compressive stresses. This is why you see fabrics with fibers running in multiple different directions. They're trying to get around this orthotropic problem, but it doesn't get around the math. We now need to check against several different strength limits, and we have four separate numbers to check for each laminate. That complicates the design problem, because the stresses in ship structures, they rarely act in a single direction. We could easily encounter a scenario where the composite works great along the fiber direction, but a small side force breaks the hull. When designing with composites, the designer really has to start considering both the magnitude and the orientation of the stresses and really remember how that's going to change as they're moving through the ship's structure. Well, that adds a whole new challenge to the cycle of structural design. In traditional steel structures, failure checks are pretty simple. You've got some algorithms and formulas to simplify all the stresses down to a single number. Then you check that number against the material limit and you adjust your thicknesses to stay under the limit. I'm oversimplifying that actually quite a bit. They are a little bit more complicated in the mathematics, but it's a fairly algorithmic procedure that you can automate. There's no simple method though to sum up all of those different stress components in a composite. At least no reliable method. There's lots of different theories. Material science gave us multiple failure theories, many different attempts at creating a single number. But like I said, we don't have a single uniform formula, and even if we did, we'd have to check that for each ply in the laminate. To be more efficient than metal structures, composite laminates need to change their orientation. They need to adapt to match the stress patterns throughout the hull. That adds a vulnerability for you if you don't get that orientation right, and it adds a whole new level for the engineer. We now need to design for both optimizing the ship structure and optimizing the material properties. Composites also disappoint in terms of reserve strength. Reserve strength? Well, did you ever see pictures of a ship's hull dented but not ruptured? That fact that the steel dented but didn't break? That's no accident. That was a design feature. This is the reserve strength of the steel. It's acting as a final safety measure. And we account for that strength when deciding on appropriate reserve factors for ship structures. The figure on your screen shows a simplified stress strain curve for metallic materials, things like steel. We designed the structures to always keep their stresses within that blue elastic region. This prevents any permanent deformation of the metals, no dents. But if disaster strikes, 
that steel still shows ample reserve strength as it progresses through that green plastic region. And the story gets even better when we talk about things like a sudden impact denting the hull. Impacts you can really quantify in terms of energy, and energy equates to the area under the curve. I want you to examine the area under the curve for the blue and green regions. This area represents the energy that the steel can absorb from some type of an impact. It shows massive amounts of energy within the plastic region. There's lots there that we can draw on. That explains why steel bends but doesn't break easily. It holds this huge untapped reserve strength for safety. On the other hand, composites break. Composites behave much more like a brittle structure. They don't have a significant plastic region in their curve. The composite just stretches until it snaps. If we designed to the limits of the elastic region, it would eliminate that reserve strength that we normally see in steel hulls. And we want that. We want reserve strength. It provides that additional safety factor against unknown risks. To compensate for that lack of plastic behavior, we cut back even further on the allowed limits for a composite. The table compares the reserve factors required by class societies for steel versus composites. The reserve factors for composites, they were almost double those of steel. That further reduces the advantages of composites. The practical design of composites severely limits their capabilities. At the beginning, I stated that pure e-glass fibers were theoretically 70 times stronger than steel. But now we have to remember the limits from manufacturing quality and the requirements for additional reserve factors. Accounting for those limits, e-glass fibers were only 2.5 times stronger than steel, again on a strength to weight basis. Well, nuts. Still, an improvement of 250% is pretty significant. Composites still present major advantages, but that extra strength comes with an additional burden. Composites require far more engineering effort to fully utilize their strength. And there are several other design considerations that I did not cover in this article. Many ships cannot justify that extra engineering cost. And really, not every ship needs the performance advantage of composites. But when we understand the practical cost and benefit of composites, it helps us identify small, specialized applications that do justify that cost. Make no mistake here. Done properly, these materials can be a game changer. With careful, targeted applications, composites can far exceed the capabilities of steel. Thanks very much. I am Nick, the Naval Architect. Oh, filming can be a lot of work. Oh, hi! Speaking of a lot of work, do you find you want to achieve more in the maritime field but need some help with that? Well, you're in luck. DMS is ready to help with engineering services customized to your needs. Check out my website to find the full range of expertise that I can assist you with. Together, we can achieve more. Thanks.